This half hour presentation is to show you the facts of the Scottish economy as it is within the UK to help people consider the constitutional questions that are around at the moment. All the information comes from these sources and no other source. The talk has three sections. The first and most complex looks at the public expenditure and revenue within the Government of Scotland. It considers Scottish trade as it is in the UK and the resources we have as a country. So taking the public sector first. Since 1992, public sector expenditure in Scotland has been called the this, chairs. It is a political construct. It was set up by Ian Lang, then Secretary of State, who in 2003, due to a leaked memo, readily agreed this was the purpose of chairs. It is now being used to, of course, discredit independence. The key point is that it is an attempt at showing the expenditure of Scotland within the Union and not as an independent country, as detractors from independence would, it, would say. So, the political purpose of the Gers Light is to show the Scottish economy as being in a poor state to make people go against the idea of independence. People, people that support the Union just taught the information from Ignoring politics and looking at the facts. Jair's public expenditure shows the income in Scotland with the government spend for Scotland. It is for the UK and not as an independent country. So the spend in Scotland is managed by the Scottish Government under the devolved settlement. Most of the taxes that are collected in Scotland are not controlled by the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government only controls income tax and what used to be called stamp duty. The rest are all estimates from HMRC. As we are not a separate country with our own borders, these will always have to be estimates. The spend for Scotland 60% of the spend is managed by the Scottish Government under the devolved settlement. The spend for this is known exactly. You have to note that by law ScotGov cannot overspend its budget and normally ends each fiscal year with one or two hundred million in credit. So, the balance of 40% is spent by Westminster, all our estimates, and it includes capital projects which Scotland contributes to as part of the UK, and it includes costs which we are recharged to Scotland as part of the UK. Some of these costs an independent Scotland would not have. Chairs, unlike a book of accounts or the council, is not a balanced account where the credits and the debits total at the end balance. There's projects like HS2, Crossrail, Hinkley Point etc, through rail, which are actually there as a UK spend for infrastructure, which is valid and we pay as part of Scotland, of the UK, we pay our share. However, the credit and benefit of any capital project spent, when that does accrue, does not get recharged and credited back to Scotland under chairs. So now let's look at these figures as produced by the HMRC and the Scottish Government. Although this is for this, these, this financial year here, if you look at the information as provided by the Scottish Government, you will see that every year is exactly the same. The structure, the issues, the format is the same. The block grant is what the Barnett formula, 
award Scotland under the control of Westminster. And this is the money for this that year, 1718, the Scottish Government spent. The UK Government spent for Scotland these figures, totaling 30 billion. Scotland has no say and no control on the allocation of either column. So the total for Scotland, according to Gers, is that this year we spent over 73 billion. According to HMRC estimates, the tax revenue was nearly 60 billion, meaning a loss of 13 billion. And it's this loss that people that support the union say Scotland is a basket case. Bear in mind where the estimates come from and what they are. Of course Scotland as part of the UK should take some of the public debt. This is quite sensible. The public debt figure of 3 billion or 3.5 billion is our share of the UK sovereign debt. When eventually Scotland does become independent, Scotland will start with no public debt as all public sovereign debt is held by the UK and was created and used by the UK. The defence recharge for an independent Scotland comparing Sweden, Denmark, Ireland, it would be expected that the defence spend would be around the 1.1 billion mark. So as you can see, this is inflated for an independent country, but valid for the UK. Transport. This is the 1.3 billion that is spent for Scotland, out with Scotland, on the UK's behalf. So in here is our recharge for Crossrail, etc. So here is a summary of this sheet. The Office of National Statistics does a report every year for the four parts of the UK showing the annual net fiscal position. This, according to HMRC, is the annual net fiscal position according to JERS. Yet this figure here is different from this figure here. If you look carefully at these figures and how they're built, you will see these are construed in the same way this is to show England in a positive light. Finally, the budget deficit, not the sovereign debt, for this year was 45 billion for the UK. So this is the countries of the UK, and in 1718 this was the populations of the UK. So Scotland has an 8.3% share of the UK population. And yet we were charged 31.5% of this, which was 14.4 billion, added to these figures here, and construed up the column. This can't be correct. In fact, in the year 1819, this recharge was 52%, and in the year 1920, it got as high as 60%. These figures are being adjusted politically. This last section, the Westminster controls 100% the spend and the collection of information for all expenditure within the UK. The Scottish Government takes what it's allowed within the devolved settlement and spends it wisely and does not overspend. So if JERS as a figure is distorted and shows a huge deficit, who then is responsible for JERS? Looking at things differently, just suppose Scotland was independent in 79 and the Scottish surplus, this blue line here, if you keep adding the surplus together every year it keeps going up or down and as you can see here in the 1980s it levelled off as the Thatcher era caused hundreds of Scottish businesses to close and then Gers cut in and it distorted the figures and then the Scottish Parliament came in and this accelerated. So according to Gers, 
for cumulative surplus for Scotland, if you start here, you end up with something like 160 billion cumulative deficit. To show how easily this can be adjusted and fiddled, if you do just to remove the UK sovereign debt from the figures for every year, this suddenly improves by 60 billion by taking that one figure off. So it doesn't take much to bring this back up. If the Scottish Government in this scenario was to put all the surplus into a bank account at the rate of interest you and I would get, which a sensible country would not do, this is the interest on the surplus, reaching here in 0708 09 at 200 billion, and it drops off simply because interest rates dropped off. Can you see how easy it is to distort? These are real figures. You can see here that 42 billion surplus in these years for public spend and not the billions, huge billions, that JERS says we have. This is a cumulative graph of the right hand column on the right. Now let's look at tax receipts. Figures from HMRC per share of the population. This is if you take all the tax receipted and divide it by the population, you get a figure. Although not all the tax comes from individuals. So these are the Scottish figures per person. These are the figures for the rest of the UK, England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Excluding Scotland. The blue shaded columns here show that for these years, Scotland contributed more tax than the rest of the UK put together per person, including England. These are simply the summary totals if you add these columns up. This is the totals where the information comes from. Deloitte an international financial institution and project management company for business, said this about JERS in 2017. Scotland has had a positive presentation in public and non-public expenditure to the UK since records began in 1901. Now moving away from JERS to the trade in Scotland's economy within the UK. Here are some figures taken from Wikipedia which show in pounds what they consider the turnover of Scotland. And this is our exports. Just as a comparison, if you take the year 17 for Scotland and convert it to dollars, this is how it would compare with some other countries. As you can see, some countries are doing a lot higher. Scotland trade and everything is controlled within the UK and the UK has mismanaged its economy for decades which I'll come to shortly. These are the figures for Scotland GDP per person without oil and including oil and gas. In an independent Scotland we would have the oil and gas. A UK GDP figure including Scotland is this. These include the Scottish figures. As you can see Scotland on its own apart from this year here was higher than the whole UK put together. Ireland was the sixth highest GDP in the world in the year shown and these are the other countries as a sample. The UK GDP was here, we were 26th in the world.
so we're not in the top. And look at growth. This is the growth in efficiency every year in GDP. As you can see, the UK compared with lots of our other countries within the world and Europe is not doing very well. Then think of inflation. And then you realise that this growth in GDP is below inflation. So our productivity and wealth are declining. However, within the UK, in this year, the GDP growth was 1.4% for the UK as a whole, and Scotland had 1.7%, second behind London within the UK. As I mentioned earlier about inflation and GDP growth, economists call this period here the year of stagnation because if you allow for inflation the UK economy only grew 2% in real terms which obviously infected Scotland. So let's look at this. This is a very brief summary of why. In the late 50s and 19, early 60s Scotland and the UK had the second largest economy in the world. At that time 55% of our wealth was from manufacturing, less than 20% as a UK today. With manufacturing, many c companies bring natural resources in from overseas, add value and then sell it back overseas, adding wealth and real money to the country's economy. In the 1970s, oil and gas was discovered. At the same time, due to a recession in the late 70s, the then Labour government closed most of the technology colleges which provided base skills for people going into manufacturing. In the 1980s, the Thatcher regime r removed trade descriptions and reduced union power. Companies started to move overseas. In 1990, this became a flood as countries in the UK went to Central Europe for cheap labour. This accelerated further to China and the Far East in the 1990s. This was manufacturing, wealth creation leaving the country. And then in the 90s onwards, banking allowed cross-world very fast transactions and the, wealth, the growth of London increased as a financial centre. So what actually happened during these years is our wealth manufacturing declined and the UK government more and more used oil and gas and banking to fund the economy, which by now was a service economy affected by recessions and people's fears on spending. It says here we were the fifth largest economy in the world. The new figures 2020 is we've dropped to the sixth. This is based on turnover and this here is based on performance and efficiency per person. The English population grew, which without an increase in GDP and efficiency, causing the productiv productivity of the UK to reduce significantly. This is the productivity figures, the, the blue columns for the UK for each of the years shown. And this is the curve, the straight line that it was following. As you can see, it started to decline here. But after the banking crash of 7 and 8, and population grew here, that's what should have happened. But this part here is a loss of efficiency and productivity within the UK. It takes a worker in the UK more time to produce the same as our competitors abroad. This is why the UK government since 2010 has been trying to reduce immigration to improve this here. Looking at these years because the figures exist which ignore oil and gas, Scotland had a positive surplus exports to imports which meant that per person that was a positive figure of £9,592 per person. England imported more than it exported and because of the larger population this means that they had a loss per person during the same period of £21,180. 
looking at the same figures another way, for this shows the different parts of England plus Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland. The orange figure is imports, the blue column exports. To make a profit on trade, your exports should be higher than your imports. If you look here, every part of England and, the, and Wales made a loss and has done so from at least the year 2000. Scotland, seen here as a trade surplus, and Northern Ireland. Scotland has a trade surplus since records began in 1901. The economies of Scotland and the rest of the UK differ in numbers because we are smaller. Scotland is smaller in population and everything. What this graph shows, if you take exports and subtract imports and then take it as a percentage, you get a positive figure if your exports are higher than imports and the opposite which is shown here. If it's the other way around and your imports are higher than exports, you get a negative figure. So as you can see here, Scotland cumulatively had a surplus every year. England and the UK, which includes Scotland, was negative. This being roughly around 54%, you can see that means that England imports 50% more in value than it exports. That's simply the summation of the figures in the table you've just seen. I emphasise here that the exports shown for Scotland and England are ex-UK and do not include internal UK trade. This does. This is Scotland for 2017, including trade to the rest of the UK. Manufacturing in the UK as a whole, including Scotland's figures within the UK, is under 20%, it's under 20% just under 19 in fact. But an independent Scotland, within the constraints we have within the UK, would have more manufacturing, but still too low. And this is where it goes to. As you can see, as you would expect, the rest of the UK is our largest business partner. Scotland has a deficit with the rest of the UK. This is Scotland, this is the rest of the UK. In 2016, this figure here was 34 billion and it's thought because of the sales of electricity to England that this figure here will nearly come up in line with the UK. Quarter 2, 2020. This shows for exports the main countries we export to and imports the main country we import from. And you can see growth or not. If you looked at last year before COVID, all these figures were very good. So you can see here the COVID effect on the economy. Some key highlights. So, not as grim as the people that support the UK would have you believe. Now let's look at some resources. These are the main industries and businesses groupings within Scotland. Compared to the 1980s and before, this is a much more diverse range and sections such as life sciences, gaming, electronics and computing are growing very fast. Renewable energy is a very fast growing sector, which looks very promising to do with undersea turbines, and that may be our future. This is the main exports from Scotland.
Within the UK, Scotland, with only 8.2 or 3 percent of the population, has huge natural resources. This list shows you a sample of some within the whole of the UK, including. To compare again one country with another is best doing it as a share of population, especially when your neighbour is much larger than you. So going quickly through these, Scotland has seven times more land in England per person, 18 times more renewable energy than England, a larger GDP than England, three times as much exports per head of population. 95 times more oil, 15 times more gas, a slightly larger tourist business. We catch 22% or 22 times, sorry, not percent, 22 times the size of the UK, England's fish catch. Now looking very briefly at oil, the UK charges oil companies 19% of what they make. Norway does the same, but it also charges them a rent for the seabed, which allows them to have a huge de uh, wealth fund, the largest in the world, for use by its population once these oil reserves disappear. Also, when the oil market re reduces, this fund here bails out the oil companies for a brief time so the employment stays steady, employment does not drop too much. As you can see, Norway and the UK have roughly the same amount of oil between these periods. But look at the difference in profit per barrel that each country made. This is due to poor commercial understanding and awareness in the past by the UK government. This statement here, for most, would actually seem can't be true, but the figures are true if you spend the time to look at the facts and look at it per person and not just the numbers, the big numbers, you will see that Scotland is richer and we have had a trade surplus and a net tax contributor and have a disproportionate level of resources for the UK and we have had this since 1901 when UK-wide figures started. Due to JERS, and even before JERS, this is what we were led to believe, that we are a small country and can't survive on our own. We're poor because we're bailed out by our wealthier neighbour and with the implication being we're too stupid to do it ourselves. This has been the message. This message has been so strong that in a polls, two polls in the autumn of 2020, 49% of Labour and 52% of Conservative voters in England believe this to be true and would be happy for Scotland to leave the Union to save England money. But, as a country, Scotland is as large as many others in the world. In fact, most countries are small. And even smaller countries, the 62 countries that have left the UK since 1949, none of them are asking to come back, and most are significantly smaller than Scotland. 
We have huge natural resources and even today, constrained by poor UK management, we are making a profit for the UK. Our education is one of the highest in the world. That's the end of my talk. Lots of information done really quickly, so you may have to pause to get the information. But Scotland can easily be independent. Thank you.